last Saturday, I started uh, talking about the five ranks of Tozon of the relationship between the relative and the absolute. And I'm going to continue that today. Although mostly introductions to the topic and then I'll expound on it further with each week. And this relationship between the relative and the absolute is very important to understand in our practice. And, uh, you know, we chant in our service this morning, the Heart Sutra, we talk about form is emptiness and emptiness is form. It's the same thing as the relative and the absolute. And then, of course, we chant the identity of the relative and absolute as well. But these um, so-called five ranks of Tozan explore the relationship between the relative and the absolute as aspects of, or even beyond that, as our life. So today I'm going to talk about the importance of the absolute. And then next Saturday I'm going to talk about the relative. And then I'll start actually getting to the subject <laughs> of the relationship between the relative and the absolute. But of course, uh, they're so intimately related, uh, like it says in the sutra, you know, like the foot before, the foot behind in walking that uh, it's hard to talk about one without the other. But we say in Zen <clears throat> that to realize the absolute is a major challenge we encounter. And it's true in all spiritual practices. And of course, synonyms for the absolute in Zen are true nature, Buddha nature, big mind, subtle source, emptiness, and the single word, mu. So, but whatever your mind can conceive, that's not the absolute because it's ineffable. We have a koan, what is the source of mu? What is the source of the absolute? What's the source of Buddha nature? What's the source of your true self? So to realize the source is like exploring a deep cave which has a stream flowing through it, and we keep going deeper to find the source. And whatever we find, we have to determine the source of that. So on a more personal level, level what's the source of your opinions? What's the source of your beliefs? What's the source of the belief that I am an independent, autonomous being. And then taking all that together, what is that source? And how far can you go? And as soon as you think you found it, there must be a source for that. So a monk asked Joshu, everything comes from the one, what does the one come from? Maybe some of you asked as a child, if God created everything, who created God? It's an innocent question of a child, but adults are afraid to ask it. It's blasphemy to ask that question. Did any of you ask that question? <laughs> and what were you told? <laughs> Maybe you're told we don't ask those questions. <laughs> so the absolute is devoid or empty of any fixed attributes. If you think you know what the absolute is, you're fixing it and consequently missing it. So in the uh, First, identity of relative and absolute, which was written by Sekito Kisen in the 8th century. There's a couplet that says, 
The subtle source is clear and bright. The tributary streams flow through the darkness. The tributary streams or branching streams refer to the phenomenal world. So thus these two lines describe what is from two perspectives. The subtle source is clear and bright because it cannot be defiled. In the phenomenal world, we can say that something is defiled. But in the absolute, things are as they are. They can't be defiled. The vast sky cannot be defiled by the clouds, storms, pollution, <clears throat> or even virtue. Only in the sphere of dualism can we talk about something being stained or wrong. The tributary streams are like the water cycle. Water flows to the ocean, evaporates, and then rains and returns to the streams. Our perspiration and other body wastes also enter that cycle. This line is also an allusion to the Zen lineage, which is not separate from us. Last, a week ago on Friday, we were talking about the lineage. And when you, if those of you who have had uh, Jukai, who have received the precepts, got a lineage chart and the, and the line of all the names of the ancestors goes down to you and then it goes back up to boot and somebody asked about that. So this Zen lineage is like the water cycle. It just keeps going back through from us to the Buddha and back to us and then back to the Buddha. So it also shows that we're not separate from the ebb and flow of the universe. And like I mentioned last time, when the Buddha was enlightened, it was recorded, he said, that I and all beings everywhere have simultaneously attained enlightenment. The Buddha affirmed the interdependence of all beings, both animate and inanimate. This realization is a cornerstone of Buddha's understanding and philosophy. And the technical term is codependent origination. Everything arises simultaneously and is informed by everything else. We can say that we're all simultaneously picked up by our own bootstraps. But the mind has difficulty getting itself around the notion that everything originates codependently. The Dharma turns us while we simultaneously turn the Dharma. The basic problem is that our worldview is distorted. It's based on false assumptions. So the fundamental false assumption is that we are an independent, autonomous, unique self and we need to protect and aggrandize it at all costs. We're willing to maintain this worldview even at the expense of our happiness, our well-being, our health, our sanity, and our peace. And also we're willing to maintain it at the expense of the peace of the world. We'd rather criticize someone else to maintain our worldview than to open our heart and include them in it. There's an ancient Indian tale that I'm sure all of you know, but uh, please bear with me. <laughs> Once upon a time, there lived six blind men in the village. And one day, one of the villagers told them, hey, there's an elephant in the village today. And they had no idea what an elephant 
is they decided even though we would not be able to see it, let us go and feel it anyway. And they all went to where the elephant was and each and one of them touched the elephant. Hey, the elephant is a pillar, said the first man who touched the leg. No, no, it's, it's a rope, said the second man who touched the tail. No, it's like a thick branch of a tree, said the third who touched the trunk of the elephant. It's like a big hand fan, said the fourth who touched the ear. It's like a huge wall, said the fifth man who touched the belly of the elephant. It's like a solid pipe, said the sixth man who touched the tusk of the elephant. And they begin to argue <laughs> about what, about the elephant and they all had their perspective and they all felt they were right. And they were really getting agitated until, you know, the village guru was passing by and he said, what's the matter? And they said, we can't agree what the elephant is like. And the guru calmly explained to them, all of you are right. See, each one of you are telling it from a different, differently because you each touched a different part of the elephant. So actually, the elephant has all the features that all of you said. Oh, they said they were no longer fighting and they felt happy, each one of them, that they were right. So from your vantage point, having seen the elephant, this tale makes a lot of sense. However, if you have a glimpse of the absolute or emptiness, you might think that it is the nature of reality. So you've touched part of it. <laughs> and like it says in the identity of absolute, seeing the absolute is not yet enlightenment. It is such a powerful experience to witness the absolute to people get stuck there and do not further pursue their practice. But seeing the absolute is not yet enlightenment. It's like the blind man and the elephant. It is only one aspect of reality. And if one gets attached, it's a pity. On the other hand, when you see the diversity of life with all the many forms, you might think that's the nature of reality. Again, we're like the blind man and the elephant. We still don't see the whole thing. So the relationship between the absolute undefiled state and the relative or phenomenal world is a vexing question. And in Zen, it's a critical issue that has been articulated by Master Tozan in its five ranks. Sometimes we discuss the relationship between the oneness and diversity. Are they the same or different? Are they one or two? Or are they not one and not two? In one of the sutras it said, uh, things are not as they seem, nor are they otherwise. So, where can we grab on and hold tight? In his fascicle Genjo Koan, Dogen wrote, when we, view, when we view the four directions from a boat on the ocean, there's no land in sight. We see only a circle and nothing else. No other aspects are apparent. So if any of you have been out on the ocean where no land is in sight, and I've done that many, many times, and you look to the horizon, it is a circle. That's all you see is a circle. And the other aspects aren't apparent. However, the ocean is neither round nor square, and its qualities are infinite in variety. And Dogen said to a fish, it's like a palace, and to a celestial being, it's like a jeweled necklace. 
it just seems circular as far as our eye can reach at that time. The 10,000 dharmas are likewise like this. So to us humans, water is water. We drink it, we bathe in it, we swim in it. For a fish, it's her home. And for transcendent beings who see a world of light, the ocean is a jeweled necklace. When you fly over the ocean in an airplane and look down at it on a sunny day with no clouds, you see all of the reflections off the ocean. Anyway, I wonder how Dogen knew that. They didn't have airplanes this time. <laughs> Oh, but they did have ships, I guess. You can go up into the crow's nest, look down on the ocean. But do you know what water is for hungry ghosts? It's bloody pus. You cannot satisfy their thirst. But what is it? And then Dogen continues. Although ordinary life and enlightened life assume many aspects, we only recognize and understand through practice what the penetrating power of our vision can reach. So how far can we penetrate? That's the challenge of our practice. Oh. Wherever we think we want to stop and rest, just keep going. There's no place. <clears throat> As we sometimes say, there's not even, even a square inch of ground upon which to stand. I don't know, but more than 10 years ago, maybe it was 20 years ago, there was this... Uh, book and movie, What the Bleep Do We Know? And it claimed that Native Americans did not see the three-masted galleons of the Europeans because it wasn't within their consciousness. As hard as that is to believe, it might be true. Or at least they didn't know what the ships were and did not understand the danger they posed. And I read about experiments with kittens where they were raised in, a, in an environment with, devoid of vertical lines. They put them in this sterile environment. It's kind of cruel, but there were no vertical lines. And then they couldn't perceive them. And, they, and then when they put them into a normal environment, they would bump into legs of tables, for example. But all it shows is that how many things that are right in front of our eyes do we not see because of our conditioning? Then there's a whole subject of worlds that exist that cannot be seen by ordinary sight. So genuine spiritual awakening absolutely threatens the status quo of a world that is built on the endless fears and hopes of the ego. If we want to be free, we actually have to let go of the very thing we want to know in order to know it. We have to be willing to forget ourselves utterly and die to the ungraspable mystery. And from then on, we have to be willing to live in a state of an unknowing, a state in which we don't know who we are. The very part that wants to know will never know the answer. So we want to know the answer in order to feel good about ourselves. And that's the ego talking. It wants certainty and simple answers. So then we might ask, 
What is it that we are lacking? And we begin to see how stuck we are in our habitual ways of thinking and behaving. So even though we don't like these habit patterns, they're not easily dissolved. And then what happens? We think we're inadequate. So the identity of relative and absolute is when there's no distinction between the inherent true self and its expression in the world of space and time. That's the identity of heart and faith. So another way to put it is what's the relationship between something and nothing? And as most important, because it points to the first revealing, <clears throat> to first revealing the self that transcends the narcissism and attachments of the ego. And then to express that self as a perfection beyond duality so that inner and outer can truly become one. Recently, I uh, reread an article by a, a Japanese uh, translator and teacher named uh, Masao Abe. And uh, he was, when I first started sitting, a lot of the translations of Zen, particularly Dogen, were made by um, Abe in um, a journal called Eastern Buddhists, Abe and Waddell. And he wrote, uh, published this article about emptiness or the absolute. And he said, emptiness is suchness. <laughs> we talked about suchness before. What does suchness mean? And, he's, and of course, uh, in Zen, we say everything is empty, which means it has no fixed nature. But Masao Abe said, it may be more adequately translated in this way. Everything is just as it is. That's suchness, just as it is. Without adding anything extra. So the rest of my talk is <clears throat> going to be about his article, which will be uh, put in my words or sometimes just uh, expressing his words. And he said that we have, uh, humans have self-consciousness, you know, but he believes trees don't or plants don't. Like, for example, a pine doesn't complain that it's not an elm tree or a rose doesn't complain that it's not a violet or a peony or, yeah, peonies are magnificent. I mean, I'm okay as a rose, but, well, peonies. <laughs> <laughs> But he says that we have self-consciousness, and because of that, we can look at ourselves from the outside and compare ourselves with others. So, although we are a self, we're not a self, because we look at ourselves from the outside. In our daily life, there are moments when we're here with, ourse with ourselves, and moments when we have a vague feeling of unity. But at other times, we find ourselves there, looking at ourselves from the outside. So the essential difference between human beings and other living beings is that we can always create a breach. And since we have self-consciousness, and are always thinking of something, we can plan, reflect, conceive ideals, and thus we can create human culture, science, art, and so forth. Only human beings are not just as they are. 
That's what emptiness is. Everything just as it is. We're moving between here and there, between inside and outside, looking our, at ourselves in comparison to others, looking out ourselves from the outside. We're always restless. The ability to make value judgments is a quality unique to self-consciousness. With self-consciousness, we can judge this is good, that's bad, and so forth. In this way, we make distinctions between this and that. We love this, we hate that. Pursue this, avoid that. Because of that, we become involved in attachments. So love is a positive attachment and hate is a negative attachment. So through these attachments, we come to like some things and dislike others. And in this way, we become attached to some things and reject others. And our attachments confirm who we are. See, let me just interject, though. It doesn't mean that we you know, like everything equally. I always say about my teacher, Maizumi Roshi, he loved everybody, but he didn't like everybody. If you get the drift. We have discerning wisdom, but that discerning wisdom is based upon understanding that emptiness is everything just as it is. In Buddhism, this self-consciousness, as Abe calls it, is regarded as ignorance. In as much in self-consciousness, we lose the reality of suchness. And we view things from the outside. So he uses the, the uh, metaphor of a snake trying to grasp oneself by oneself from the outside. He said it's like a snake trying to swallow its own tail. Just think about it. He takes it all the way to the end. He says, as the snake starts swallowing its own tail, the circle gets smaller and smaller, right? <laughs> Until eventually it gets so small it's just a dot. And then that dot has to disappear into emptiness. So he says the snake has to die through its efforts. So let's put the analogy to their human ego attachment. So if we try to get rid of it, the ego can no longer support itself. As we look into it and look into it, it's like the snake eating its own tail. Eventually it collapses into emptiness. And that's what Dogen said. To study the self is to forget the self to swallow the whole thing. So the human ego has to let go. It can't sustain itself as we penetrate into it deeper and deeper. So awakening to emptiness or the absolute or suchness which is revealed through the death of the ego, one realizes one's suchness. In this realization, you're no longer separate from yourself, but are just yourself, no more, no less. There's no gap between you and yourself. You become you. How can it be otherwise? I mean, this sounds so trivial. 
How many of you are not you? <laughs> but what does it mean to really be yourself? And how many of you have thoughts on a daily basis, I shouldn't be like this? Or what's wrong with me that I'm like this? This, however, is not a goal to be reached. For suchness is the ground of both our being and the world. Not something in the future, but here and now, we can immediately realize suchness because we're never separated from suchness, not even for a moment. It's the ground to which we must return and from which we must start. I was in a dialogue with some of my college classmates on a listserv because I read something about this priest that baptized thousand infants, infants in the church, said that his baptisms were all invalid because he used the word we instead of the word I in the ceremony of the baptism. Does some of you read about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. See, according to this article I read, that it's Christ who baptizes, not the priest. And so it has to be I. If he says we, it implies a whole congregation is supporting the baptism, and that's invalid. So all of, all of these infants that he baptized, you know, were incorrectly baptized, and the baptism was invalid. And there's some, um, there's an Episcopal priest in, on this uh, listserv with these people who wanted to get their take on it and, and some other people who are very religious Christians. And I thought that the spirit in which the baptism is given is more important than the precise words. And they confirmed it, although the, the um, conservative Catholic establishment, you know, claimed that it uh, they were invalid. And, and you need to be baptized in order for salvation. And one of them wrote that a priest friend of his said, if you want to go to heaven, go now. <laughs> so if you want to realize suchness, What better time? It's a beautiful day. So you can live your life really and fully without creating conflict with others. And every day is a good day. This is what is meant by saying everything is empty. <clears throat> 